I think this whole proliferation of online content and building an audience is absolutely remarkable mm -hmm. and it's absolutely effective. And, and you've learned that on your own. And yeah. it, it, it plays a huge role um, in growing businesses. And it doesn't matter if you're a plumber or an electrician or a consultant or a marketing or a software. It just doesn't matter. Building an audience and building content is really, really critical. Yeah. Um, having said that, I think a lot of times people ignore um, the opportunity like right in front of them. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Business Owner Elevation Podcast. It's Leon Street in the house. And you know what? The weather is shining. I'm feeling that sun. We're fresh off the weekend and we're ready to kickstart our week. We've got another amazing guest waiting in the wings. And I just want to welcome to the show, first of all, Mr. Cade Wilcox. How are you doing, Cade? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate you. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. So I was targeted unsolicitedly by Cade's team trying to get him on the show. And you know what? I'm super excited that they actually reached out to me because I believe Cade's going to bring you an awesome message about how you can grow your business through his experiences. And so what I want to do, guys, is I'm going to read off his bio just so you get a feel for who Cade is. And then we're going to get stuck into this interview. So Cade Wilcox is the owner and CEO of Primitive Social, a digital marketing agency in Lubbock, Texas, focused on helping companies grow through software development, web design and development and inbound marketing plus sales enablement. In 2011, Cade and his wife Lacey started Primitive Social, providing social media support to local businesses. In 2013, Cade and Lacey connected with Jared Hurst, now co-owner of Primitive Social and decided to focus on growing the company. Over the past six years, Cade has helped transform Primitive Social from a two-person team into a multi-million dollar company with nearly 50 employees. That's pretty impressive, guys. So Cade is happily married to Lacey and has a beautiful seven-year-old daughter named Sela. I hope I pronounced that right. Nailed it. Okay. And an incredible six-year-old son named Casey. So thank you. I'm looking forward to this interview. I like the fact that you've got kind of family mentioned in that as well as your partners. And so it kind of gives me an insight into the kind of person you are already, Cade, which is I'm assuming a kind of family guy who, you know, looks out for other people, unless I've got this totally wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate, I appreciate you saying that. Um, I think that my family is the best part of me mm -hmm. and uh, my business partner, Jared, is the second best part of me. So awesome. without either of those two groups, uh, we, we would have not, we have gone nowhere. So. Okay. Awesome. Well, awesome. So let, let's get this kicked off then. So you've done something amazing, you know, what most business owners hope to achieve, which is that kind of million dollar mark, million pound mark. Um, and you've done it as far as I'm reading multiple times. What I'd like to ask you is, do you have a kind of mantra or way of working or a success quote that you kind of dial in and think, you know, when that's my go-to when I'm thinking about let's go to the next level. Yeah, there are two, I don't really have any magical quotes, you know, by famous people, but there are two kind of ideas that I'm constantly trying to balance. Mm -hmm. um, one, one is just kind of do the work, one, one foot in front of the other, every single day, kind of chop wood, carry water, uh, nose to the grindstone, uh, you know, keep your head down, keep going forward. Mm -hmm. So that, that's kind of one idea um, that I think is really important to our success. The other is, is to create space to dream and imagine what we're trying to create and where we're trying to go. And, and I have found that a, a good deal of businesses spend all their time in, in one or the other of the categories. So you have these entrepreneurs and kind of solopreneurs and kind of freelancers who, who just live in the cloud and, and they just uh, kind of spend all their time in imagine, imagining and dreaming like success is just going to accidentally happen. Mm -hmm. but then you have this other group of people who spend no time dreaming, no time in imagining the, the future and, uh, the future they're trying to create and they, they just have their, their kind of hand to plow one foot in front of the other kind of grinding it out. And, and uh, as imperfectly as we do it, we, we try to do both. Mm -hmm. um, so I have to create space to dream or else uh, I'll die. <laughs> I have to, I have to dream. And yet at the same time you have to do. And so we try to balance those two things. So mm -hmm. I think those two kind of philosophies are really 
uh, critical and have, have certainly been critical to, to our own success. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for sharing those. And I, I can definitely identify with what you've shared there in terms of doing the work and creating the space to dream and imagine. And I, I think a lot of people listening to this right now, Elevation Nation, is a lot of the time when you're in your business, you kind of, you're either one or the other, you're either a dream or you're just stuck in the work and you don't look up and, you know, see what's going on around you. And I think the combination of the two is important. I remember reading the book, The um, One Thing, um, and it, it speaks about life in terms of counterbalance because nothing is ever equally balanced because we all yeah. have, you know, we give kind of more weight to one thing, whether it's family, business, you know, life, friends than others. And I, and I think that's an important thing that you've mentioned there because for, for all of you listening right now, it is the counterbalance. So, okay, let's go a bit deeper then. Let, let's go into this story. So give me a kind of five to 10, mis 10 minutes kind of backstory as to where it started for you. I don't know if it's before the business that, that we spoke about in your bio, Like, where did the, your journey start for you to become right up to the point where you are now? Yeah, that's uh, fun to reflect on, isn't it? Um, so, I, you know, I, I've, I've tried to identify these elements of, of, of my story that kind of led up to our entrepreneurial journey and, and kind of our successful business. And the kind of uh, a few kind of what I, benchmarks or key points in my life that I think really contributed to our existing success and kind of this, this entrepreneurial path that we've been on. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, one of the things that w was, has been really impactful in my life in hindsight was the fact that we played a lot of sports. So growing up, I grew up in a town of 350 people. I was a rural community out in the middle of nowhere, mm -hmm. and uh, we were just obsessed, uh, obsessed with sports. So I, I grew up with the same group of friends and uh, grew up in a huge family. Um, I had uh, you know, nearly 30 first cousins. Wow. And so we just grew up in this really competitive environment where we were playing sports. And I think back on that and, and the things that I learned uh, throughout that process, and, and they had a huge impact on where we're at now, whether mm -hmm. it be discipline or whether it be this, you know, this real desire to win, uh, regardless of, of what, what, what we're doing. Um, and those things had a huge impact. What it what it means to be a part of a team, um, you know, I, there to me there there is no kind of self made person. You you've heard that from a tremendous amount of people in history who kind of debunked that idea that anyone is self made. And uh, that's that's my story. I mean, there are tons of people who made a tremendous impact on my life. And there's certain I think qualities that I bring to our team now um, mm -hmm. that I I picked up on and observed and learned. Uh, from people and past experiences. And I, I think growing up in this rural community um, and, and being a part of a huge family and playing sports in hindsight has had a huge impact on my life and even, even contributes now. So I went to college and they were kind of the, the wondering years. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I'm the classic example of someone who went to college because you assumed and believed and heard that was the thing that you did. Yeah, yeah. And so I uh, suffered through college for five years uh, trying to figure out, um, you know, what, what I wanted to do and who I wanted to become. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm glad I, I did. I, I think the, the primary impacts that, that uh, college had on me were the jobs that I had and the people are around. Mm -hmm. So I have a college degree. I barely graduated through a degree in history. Um, I guess I'm thankful for that, um, but I'm primarily thankful for, for the jobs I had and the people I was surrounded with because they, they made a tremendous, tremendous impact on me. And again, these are things that you, you don't really see in the moment. Uh, but as I look over the last 10, 15 years, um, you know, th this kind of, uh, kind of wondering years had a, had a major impact yeah. uh, in a few ways primarily. Um, so I worked at a, I worked at a camp. And uh, there were a handful of people that led this camp that, that made a huge impact on my life at that moment. I observed their discipline. I observed their ability to build an organization. Yeah. Um, I uh, observed their empathy, um, given that I was kind of really curious and, you know, kind of in the desert. Uh, they listened to me and, and uh, um, really, you know, guided me um, with wisdom and their own perseverance and their own grit. And so these are all things that, that I picked up on and kind of became over time, again, not, not really knowing that this, these things were shaping me, yeah. uh, but they certainly were. It's a really long story, but at the age of 25, I was single. Um, I was in a seminary uh, halfway across the country. And this uh, church camp that's like 85 years old, about 400 acres, kind of really, really old the buildings, um, their executive director left six weeks before the camp started. Wow. Uh, which is about the worst time you can possibly lose your yeah. leader in a particular yeah. industry. 
And, uh, and so it's a long story, but they asked me to come and be the interim executive director of that camp for the wow. summer, uh, knowing that I would not be interested in the full-time position because I was a student. And so I came and did that. And it was the most remarkable experience I'd ever had. I had never in my life uh, kind of been given an extreme amount of uh, leadership and ownership over a, a particular thing. So I'd always been a leader. Now I'd always had an opportunity to contribute uh, to a team through, through sports and through, through other things. But I never had an experience like this where I was kind of just given this blank slate. So I had to hire staff and manage staff. I got to manage the property and the facilities. I got to manage programs and relationships and customers with the camp. And uh, that was really the first time uh, that I would given any kind of entrepreneurial responsibility, even though I could have never articulated it like that at the time. And it was an absolute home run. Uh, it was an absolute blast. Uh, I fell in love with the work. I fell in love with the opportunity. And I was ultimately given the, uh, given the full-time executive director's job. So wow. I started a nearly four-year journey of, of getting to raise money and getting to imagine a future and you know, create a strategic plan and build out a team and uh, develop relationships with all the stakeholders and, and the executive board and things like that. And uh, that was really the first time I uh, realized I was an entrepreneur mm. and uh, was a really, really, really pivotal time in my life and, made, um, and made, made a huge impact. So that season came and went, um, had a huge impact on my life. I uh, learned a lot of what I was good at and what I was not good at. Um, and, and as my, uh, so I got married while I was out there and we moved, moved on away from the camp and moved to Lubbock, uh, the city we live in now. Yeah. So I took a job working at a church, uh, which I wanted to do. I was excited to do. My wife and I were, uh, had our first kid. We moved to Lubbock. We we're excited to be a part of this city and, and this new work. There was one challenge. Um, the salary I was making at the church was very, 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 very little. Yeah. And I had no desire to live um, on that kind of income. Hmm. And so we started this uh, kind of thought process of, okay, what can we do to create some supplemental income? Yeah. My wife had always been a really, really good content uh, developer. And so we had started following two guys. Uh, you might've heard of one of them uh, named Michael Hyatt. Yeah. So we started following Michael Hyatt. We started following this other guy named John Saddington. Mm -hmm. And both of them were kind of pioneers in their space of, of basically making money off of, of blogging. Yeah. So we started watching that and observing it. Both of them had content series uh, where they literally went from A to Z on, on how to build a website and how to start creating blogs and how to build an audience and doing some of these things. Mm -hmm. and we, were, we were enamored with it. So we moved to Lubbock uh, and we had, had spent this last year observing them and reading everything, yeah. every single thing that we could get on it. And a friend just mentioned, he's like, hey, why don't you think about um, managing businesses' Facebook pages? So this is in 2011. Okay. So I'm like, okay, well, this, this might be a relevant way to put my wife's skill set of, of content development and writing to yeah. you. So we landed our first client, $500 a month. It was a rural hospital system, and uh, we talked them into letting us manage their Facebook page for $500 a month. Mm -hmm. And we decided, you know what, we'll do this for, uh, for a while, and if we can add value to this hospital, and we're actually good at what we say that we think we could be good at. Yeah. Uh, we'll try to pick up a second client. So um, just kind of abbreviate the story. We did that for about two and a half years. Mm -hmm. And we just kind of organically grew. So I worked full time at the church. Uh, my wife, uh, I would pick up the client and hand them to her. And she would yeah. you know, manage it from A to Z. And uh, we did a really good job. So we picked up about a dozen clients. And this uh, really fun thing happened. Um, in my head, you know, we're rolling. We got this business on the side. Yeah. And my best friend called it a hobby. And it really pissed me off because I'm competitive. <laughs> and uh, I started reflecting on what he said. And I realized, you know what? Uh, he's right. This is a hobby. Mm -hmm. We have no bills. We have no uh, sales goals. We have no real organizational development. Um, we have no team. Um, you know, we don't have some of these core components of, of what make it different from a hobby to a yeah. business. Yeah. And so, and, and the very elementary way that we knew how we, uh, in 2013, we really started trying to think of it as a business. Mm -hmm. So we started setting sales goals and we started really trying to imagine what our company could look like. And so I set some sales goals for, you know, the first, it was, uh, I was traveling uh, to a mountain town about four hours from here with my dad. Yeah. I'll never forget this. I had a yellow legal pad. And so I started thinking about, okay, what would turn this into a business? And the only, the only thing at the time I could think of was sales goals. And so I wrote down in uh, 2014, we want to make $100,000. Mm -hmm. In 2015, we want to make uh, $250,000. And in 2016, 
when you make uh, $500,000. So that's where it started. And uh, what's fun in hindsight is uh, we, we blew all that out of the water. So the first year we, need, we made $98,000, so we almost met our goal. The next year we made $460,000, so we doubled our goal. And then the following year we just uh, we did around $1.4 million. So you know, we kind of crushed it. This year we're on pace to do over $4 million. So we'll, wow. we'll do over $4 million in four years. Now we have uh, nearly 50 employees. Half our employees work here in Lubbock. Half our employees are remote employees that work yeah. all over the country. And uh, we're having a blast. And so um, it's been a really fun journey. Um, we've made a lot of mistakes along the way. Mm -hmm. We've had some success. We have a long ways to go. Um, but every morning we wake up, we really look forward to our work. Mm. And uh, it's extremely rewarding. So awesome. it's really, really hard to complain. Congratulations, by the way. Because, I mean, that's, Thank you. A, that's an amazing story to share the result. I've got to ask you, that's a real burning question from what you said. What's your go-to sport, Cade? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Oh, this is so difficult. <laughs> you know, growing up, it was basketball. I spent... You know, that whole uh, 10,000 hour rule, um, that, that was my sport. Mm -hmm. um, but it, if I had a choice right now, I would probably pick college football. Ooh, okay, yeah. okay. That, it's, you, it's tell nice, me, but... are, they, are they interested in college football where you're at? No, not, nope. <laughs> not even a blip on the radar. Like, <laughs> serious. That's I'm, a, I'm a basketball fan. I played okay. basketball when I was younger. Uh, okay. I'm, watch, I'm watching the playoffs right now. So That's cool. Yeah, for me, that's kind of the goal. Who, who, uh, who's, your, who's the team you think is going to ultimately win it all this summer? I think, I think Golden State's going to win it because yeah. um, – I've got a feeling LeBron may pull the team through against the Celtics, but I think the the Warriors, the, the team stronger rather than just yep. the one individual. Yep, I would agree with you, and I'm definitely going for the Celtics in case you're interested. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if um, yeah. LeBron's intimidation from the last game has had yeah. any impact. But no, that's cool. That's cool. Um, so I've got a few questions just kind of piggybacking from obviously where – you, you explain where you came from and then moving through. And I think the diverse um, experiences, what you've had have, have really probably helped to, to where you've got to now. And we all, I think there's always that saying, when you look back, you can always connect the dots looking backwards rather than forwards. And, you know, what you've then gone on to do is really cool because I think a lot of people, you know, start with the kind of goals you've just, you, you mentioned, but actually not everybody goes and achieves them, Never mind smashes them with what you've, you've done so far. And I think all credit to you and your team. So my question, I suppose, at this, this point is, in doing so, I imagine you probably made some mistakes along the way. Um, I'd love for you to share with me probably one of the, the, the bigger failures, whether it's more recent or during that four-year journey, um, just so you can share with our listeners, you know, what was the biggest lessons that you learned to come out the other side of it? And, and that's really where I find the value is what you learned from it as opposed to dwelling on there being some kind of failure or challenge. Yeah, there, there are really two, two kind of themes I think of when I think of the, the failure over the last um, six years, but especially the last three years as we've yeah. really been serious about growing our company. Number, number one would be just setting proper client expectations. Mm -hmm. um, number two would be hiring, building a team. Um, when, when we have failed, when we have messed up, it, it usually relates to one of those two things. Mm -hmm. We haven't properly communicated with the customer or, you know, I just got in a, uh, in a hurry on the sales journey just because I wanted to close it, close it, close it, close it. Yeah. And it ended up not being the right, not, not being the right client, not yeah. just being the right client for us, but we weren't the right team for them. And so yes. it was, it was a failure for both, both of us. And so when I think of failure, I think of those two things. I mean, I could go into so much detail in terms of customers mm -hmm. where, where we just didn't have the right expectations of them and them of us. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so it was, it was just uh, doomed to fail from the very beginning. And, yeah. and, and what's challenging is the implications that it has on our team, right? So, you know, it's one thing for me to, to miss the mark in the sales mm -hmm. journey and not set up proper expectations, but really the ramifications primarily fall on our team who have to live with and absorb that, that bad client experience uh, for six months or nine months or a year or however long, you know, both, both parties kind of suffer through the wrong relationship. And so, so I would say that that is, you know, one of the kind of common threads that we've learned the hard way. Yeah. We're better at it now, but, you know, I don't, I don't know that you ever perfect that. I think you learn as you go um, and, and, you, and, you, and you try to limit it. But um, so that's one. And then two is hiring. Um, and in the same way, you know, um, you know, our organization is not, not for every person. My, yeah. my leadership is not for every person. Our culture is not for every person. 
And uh, it's the same thing. Sometimes we get in a hurry and, uh, you know, we, we get the cart in front of the horse and we hire the wrong people. Sometimes it's our fault. Sometimes it's theirs. Uh, but again, the ramifications can, can be quite significant. And right. so those, those are the two things that I, I look back over the last uh, coming up on seven years this fall. And, you know, that is a common thread of, of, mm-hmm. of where we've made some mistakes and where we're continually trying to learn. So it's, it's an interesting point, actually, because I've been through similar experiences either with customers and with team members who you bring into the business, um, having managed uh, bigger teams as well in the past. And, um, I suppose one of the questions I've got off the back of it is then what would you say has helped you? Cause I know I agree with you. It's, it's one of those constantly evolving things that, you know, you can't get it hundred percent right. But what are the two things that you've put in place either to attract the right customers or qualify them? And also the same thing with your team members. What have you done that, that could probably help the listeners? That's great. Right yeah, it's a great question. And there, there are two things that apply to both, uh, you know, hiring uh, customers, right? Like when yeah. we, when we bring on a customer and hiring talent. And there's two things that we've done over the last, I would say maybe 18 months to a year that have made a big impact. Number one is we've defined a process. So a lot of times uh, things can fall through the cracks and, and, and we can uh, we cannot do good work when there's a lack of process. Yeah. So for, for you know, bringing on new customers, uh, we, we have a documented and defined a, a sales process that we go through for, for every type of customer that we have. Mm-hmm. And by going through that process and being intentional and thoughtful about what that process is, the kind of questions you ask, the kind of meetings you have, kind of a discovery and diagnostic type uh, yeah. meetings that you have has really helped us uncover uh, all these different uh, aspects of the customer throughout mm-hmm. the journey. So we know exactly what we're getting cool. and the same for the customer, right? It's not just about us. Yeah. hiring the right customers it's, it's mainly and mainly about the customer getting the right partner in us mm. so they can maximize their success so the process has been really really important uh for for the the sales journey which has helped define and identify the right kind of customers and then number two it's about bringing in our team so you know i'm responsible at this point for 100 percent of our sales and uh you know uh, for the last several years what it looked like is i would chase down a customer i would get them all the way to convert it Mm -hmm. And then I would hand them off to the team. Mm -hmm. The first time the team met the customer and the customer met the team was after we had already converted. So they were not a part of any of the process, any of the questions. They weren't a part of the journey. They didn't have an opportunity to ask their own questions Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the same for the customer. And so it was kind of like this uh, wake up call, you know, when we handed off the customer and and, and the customer felt like they were completely starting over because I went away. Now they're dealing with these new people. Yeah. And our team felt like, you know, they were set up on a blind date and just, you know, had to immediately succeed. And so the two things that have, have made an impact on, um, you know, customer expectations and finding the right customer and setting it up for success in the long run has been the process and bringing in, in the team from the very, very beginning and al- allowing them to be a part of the journey. Cool. And it's made it substantially better. The same is true of hiring. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, I'm notorious for hiring really, really, really fast because we're trying to meet a need. And so you, someone comes in the door, you feel like you resonate with them and you hire them and you throw them into the madness and expect them to, uh, swim and most of them sink. Yeah. And so, so we've applied the, the, the same two principles to the hiring process, which is we've defined a process and two, we brought in other people, uh, to be a part of the process. So, yeah. So in the past, I would just kind of manage it from start to finish, and it was really, really fast. Mm-hmm. Now I'm the last person who, who, who meets and, and connects with them. Yeah. So our team starts the process, goes through a documented and defined process, and then uh, we have a lot of people a part of the journey, uh, which makes it much more robust, better questions, a better discovery, better digging into it, better relational building throughout the process. Um, and it's made a huge impact. So both awesome. a process and bringing in people have made a huge impact um, on on getting better at those things. Yeah, yeah. I think it's really important in terms of systemizing your approach in the different areas. And I, I like the fact that you, you've mentioned the process that you have and then also the fact that you're introducing team into that, that, that process so they're part of the journey. And I think part of that is just like you say, in terms of expectations and relationship development with the client, with your team and so on. I think it's a really cool thing. So um, thanks for sharing that with us, Kate. I'm sure everybody listening will appreciate that because they're, they're probably scratching their head like, how did this guy, because 
I'd be the same way if I was listening and growing my business right now. Like, how did he smash his goals? Which leads me on to my next question. So, I mean, obviously on, on the kind of financial result of what you've achieved in your business, you've, you've done some really awesome things. Um, I'd like you to share with us either one, maybe two, depends. It's, it's entirely up to you, successes that you've had and why you think the success came about. Yeah, the, the first thing I think of when I when I hear your question is just kind of our success over the last three years in general. I mean, we're in a really small market. Um, in many ways, we've been building this plane as we're flying it. And so, uh, you know, certainly we've worked hard and uh, our customers have been really generous to us. Our team is amazing. Mm -hmm. But in, in many regards, I just feel exceptionally lucky <laughs> that, uh, you know, as we've built the plane in the air, it continues to fly and, you know, we're getting to our destination. And so I'm really grateful for that. Um, I, I think that some of, some of the elements for our success have been that we've been extremely connected and strategic in our local market okay. and developing relationships. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think this whole proliferation of online content and building an audience is absolutely remarkable mm -hmm. and it's absolutely effective. And, and you've learned that on your own. And it, yeah. it, it, it plays a huge role um, in growing businesses. And it doesn't matter if you're a plumber or an electrician or a consultant or a marketing or a software. It just doesn't matter. Building an audience and building content is really, really critical. Yeah. Um, having said that, I think a lot of times people ignore um, the opportunity like right in front of them. Building an audience with content and, 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 and uh, that, that, that's a long process. Yeah, yeah. Um, very few people hit a grand slam in their first six months or a year or two I, years. I it's a long game and uh, it's really important and people should do it and we're doing it and you're doing it. Yeah. It's very, very critical. So don't misunderstand me here. But I think a lot of people are kind of uh, missing uh, really big opportunities that are right in front of him that, that are kind of old school, you know, building relationships, just building relationships on the merits of being helpful yeah. And uh, a lot of times those, those things reciprocate into working relationships, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I would say that one of the things that we've been the most successful in and the thing that has made the most impact on our business is doing that. Is it being a part of organizations and building relationships, one-on-one -on -one relationships, mm -hmm. out of a desire just to simply be helpful. Yeah. As we have done that, some of those relationships have reciprocated into working relationships and it's built our business. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think some people may go, ah, yeah, maybe, maybe <laughs> that's them. Just, you know, what's crazy is like, we're a, we're a digital marketing company and 99% of our revenue is just in the city of Lubbock, which is a very small city. Wow. And 99% of those leads came from one-to-one -one relationships, not our inbound marketing, which we're getting a lot better at mm -hmm. and it's beginning mm -hmm. to work but 99% of our success has been one-to-one -one relationships and, and building our company in that way. And yeah. so I think a lot of people ignore that um, and, and lose out on a tremendous amount of opportunity. And mm -hmm. I would say that's you know, one of the biggest things we've been able to do to create success. Cool. That, uh, I'm so happy you shared that actually, Kate, because if I'd have made a prediction beforehand, I would have said it's getting into conversation with people. And the fact that you said that, you know, the opportunity that is in front of a lot of people, building relationships, I agree people miss it because um, I, I think what gets, what, what tends to happen, and I've been there as well, for instance, my third pod, sorry, my first podcast, we launched it and we went for a year without really thinking about, well, what is it enabling us to do? We were just putting content out there. It's like you say, that, that stuff's got to happen because you're, you're forever putting the message out into the marketplace. Yeah. And, you know, at some point you can go back to it. But then what, what we started to realize is kind of like, well, that's cool. That's got to happen regardless. But what are we doing to actually get into conversation with the people who either we're just building up relationship or actually people who need this, the help and support right now? Um, and I was having this conversation with a client of mine. Um, and that came as a referral from another client again relationships conversations mm -hmm. but the point yeah. i wanted to get to is um they're burning a hole in their pocket right now they're actually from america and boston and they're burning a hole in their pocket trying to attract leads from facebook and i took a just a, a quick look kind of summary executive look at what's going on with their strategy and i said look i said here's the reality you're probably going to have to stop the facebook ads and and move from away or move away from a place where you think it's the answer and i said exactly what you just said i said the answer is right in front of you you've got to connect with more people and the fastest opportunity you probably have 
in terms of leverage and online is LinkedIn. I said, because you can connect to people, you can target a state or a city and you can get straight to the yeah. decision maker and just yeah. start right there. Um, so for me, it's actually a really powerful thing. And, and I also agree with you in terms of people saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just as one example, we, we ran a new tactic in April recently just to test um, a new messaging sequence we were putting out on LinkedIn, like with my VA. And that brought in like $30,000. It's not huge, but here's the thing. It was just one tactic of what we're doing. And, and what I explained to people, all it was was just accelerating um, persuasion in a conversation. And so all we did was look at the exact way we can connect with people. So the, the stuff that you just shared for me, I think it's a really powerful thing for our listeners in terms of success. And I, I love the fact that you just said that, but 99% of your audience is in Lubbock. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, right now. I mean, that, that's what has us so excited. I mean, we've had tremendous success in a really small market. Yeah, yeah. And obviously the work we do, uh, as you know, can be done, you know, kind of quote globally. And Absolutely. so um, and so we're really excited because in, in many respects, we're, we're just getting started. And mm. so um, I think what you shared is, is good insight. I mean, I think as, as, as the world and uh, people continue to move in a digital and kind of technology direction, I think the reality of it is, is that it'll actually start, uh, the thing that will make the most impact will be human connection. Absolutely. And so I think people will start to miss, uh, you know, what was true 10, 15, 20 years ago, and yeah. it was a one-to-one -one human connection. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not to say that digital technology will go away, that it, it's only going to accelerate. Yeah, I agree. Um, the people that can do both really well, mm -hmm. build human relationship and connection, with their ability to leverage digital and technology will be the people that win. And Absolutely. Um, that's pretty, pretty exciting. Yeah, and that, that was the whole reason why I did the test in April because I took on a new um, VA um, and she was specifically just to get into conversations and off the back of that, well, you know, it worked. Um, and so thanks for sharing. So, so here's the thing, you've had some phenomenal success. Yeah. What would you say the three key takeaways from how you accelerated to where you are now in business because you know it's pretty phenomenal you're near to 50 employees you've you've done near four million or above sorry um you know you you've done what a lot of people would like they've, they've probably spent their lifetime trying to achieve and it's just not happened so what would you you say are the three key things that have made it happen for you mm, that's a really great question um Maybe in no particular order, although I, yeah, I tend to cool. think this is in a particular order. I mean, like number one is our team. Um, you know, it doesn't matter how talented you are. There are things you're not, there are things you're not good at. There are gaps in your game. Mm -hmm. And I think that to a degree that you can build a team of people around you who are better than you, more talented than you, smarter than you. Um, I think the black blue you are to, you know, to succeed. So the number one thing I think of is our ability, it has been our ability to build a team yeah. of really, really uh, talented, passionate people. And without them, there's, there's, there's literally no way we could have accomplished what we've accomplished or accomplished what we very, very much intend on accomplishing over the next year, two, three, five years. So yeah. number one would be two, team. Number two is sales. Like, you can have the best idea, the best business model, the best concepts, you know, yada, 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 yada. And if you don't have the ability to sell, you've got nothing. And so you can have the biggest dreams and the biggest aspirations. And if you don't have the ability to convince someone that they need what you have, um, then you got nothing. And mm -hmm. so number one would be your ability to build a team. Number two would be your ability to sell. And number three would be, uh, and this sounds super like like obvious, but it's extremely critical. But number three would be able to deliver a really, really a good customer experience. Yeah. So let's say you've built a good team. Let's say you, you have the ability to sell and, and build your business. If you don't have the ability then to deliver, to execute on, on your service or, or, or deliver a great product, mm -hmm. um, you know, then you're, you're just going to be on a hamster wheel because you'll always just be replacing your revenue. So yeah. someone will be coming in, other people will be leaving you because you're not delivering a good experience. And so therefore you're never able to accomplish scale. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think any of those things are uh, rocket science. I mean, I think your audience probably very well understands that mm -hmm. um, and, and probably could have said that on their own, but those three things uh, in, 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 to us have been the most critical uh, components to, to our success. Mm -hmm. And quite honestly, I think they will be the three most critical components to our success uh, moving forward, accomplishing what we want to accomplish. Yeah, in the yeah. 
I agree. Um, there's a book by Chet Holmes. I don't know if you've ever read it, The Ultimate Sales Machine. Um, and he documents his journey from taking a business from one to 300 million and he breaks wow. it up into four key areas. Um, and the book is phenomenal. And one of the, the key steps in him is every business that you want to grow is through sales and therefore you've got to grow the team. And he focuses on exactly what you say. And I think it is the obvious, but here's the reality. A lot of people don't act on it because of, you know, it's my baby. I can't let go. Yeah, sure. And you know, all those kind of things. And actually that's, that's the part where you've got to accelerate through. Um, and I think it's, it's actually the biggest thing to, to give you freedom. What most people seek and don't realize that actually being interdependent, i.e. you saying I'm okay with having a team and being dependent on them to deliver on my behalf is actually the key to success. So thanks for sharing that. I know I kind of just threw that one in there, but no, that's good. Yeah. I, I wanted people to, to just get the, the kind of inside. So, so just tell me then, so what, based on your opinion right now, the state of play of business where, where you're in right now, what should people be paying attention to? Uh, again, this probably is no surprise, but I, I think we waited way too long to start creating cr uh, content mm -hmm. uh, that, that was helpful and built our audience. You know, it seems a little odd to say that we're a content marketing company mm -hmm. and uh, we waited too long to start creating content. And yeah. so, you know, we, we should have started doing what our growth team is doing now uh, mm -hmm. three, four, five years ago. And, uh, and we did it. And so I think that there's this, you know, common mistake where people get busy and uh, use the fact that they're busy delivering their service as a, as a justification for not doing the thing. They need to be doing for themselves mm -hmm. and uh, I think that's a huge mistake and so again it's not a it's not a very uh, it's not a very you know big sexy answer but I think the faster you start creating content that adds value to your audience mm -hmm. um, the the sooner you are to, to win playing that game yeah and, uh, it's 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 the long game as you yourself know, mm -hmm. um, you know creating content building an audience does not bring immediate success um, but I think that uh, even as crowded as the content space is, mm -hmm. there's huge opportunities to to bring unique insight and and just to be helpful to your audience. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that helps. Um, I think that's going to help grow grow your company or or your product or service. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that's the single thing that that I regret we didn't do earlier. Yeah. And uh, we're we're fully committed to it at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Uh, I think it's an important step because the the other thing is your awareness around what the content is actually for and it, it, again it might say you know a lot of these things we're saying it might sound the obvious thing but the reality is when i look back on kind of like the blogs or the videos that i used to create it wasn't for any particular niche and it wasn't solving any particular right. problem it was kind of like roundabouts and I, and I think the more you start to dial that in and it happens because you do the content and your content becomes more refined, it's like, ah, that's the thing that triggers with people. Yeah. That's the thing that resonates. I think that's where you find the answers as well. So, so thanks for sharing that. So here's, here's a biggie then. What's the one thing in business or how you work that you can't live without? And it can't be your ear pods. <laughs> yeah. Okay. My iPhone. No. Um, I like for me personally, it's kind of just space to dream, mm -hmm. you know, dreaming and imagining the future we want to create for our lives and, and yeah. for our business uh, is kind of the wind in my cells. Yeah. So if, uh, if that space and opportunity were to be eliminated, I, I would kind of uh, quite significantly lose, you know, kind of my hunger and desire to do mm -hmm. what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And so I've always been a dreamer and uh, it, it's just really energizing is the thing that gives me gives me kind of life. And, yeah. um, and so that's the, that's the definitely the single greatest thing that I just couldn't, couldn't do without. Thanks for sharing Cade. Yeah. Now, so we're, we're drawing near to the end of the interview. And I, first of all, I just want to say thank you for taking the time out for this interview with our Elevation Nation and myself. So they're along with us really appreciate it. If somebody wishes to get in touch with you, what's the best way? Can you share um, your web address and maybe the social yeah, sure. media profiles that you're most active on? Yeah, absolutely. There, there are two things. First of all, you can go to our website, primitivesocial.com. I'm sure you'll put that in your show notes, yeah, but um, that's our company website and yeah. all that information comes directly to me and our team. Um, and then two, my email. I mean, if you have questions or thoughts or you want to dig into something that I said, then you can just email me directly. It's uh, Cade, K-A-D-E at primitivesocial.com. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I love, I love talking about, you know, what we're doing and, and uh, what you're doing. So if someone wanted to reach out and be Happy to happy to connect. 
Awesome. Thank, thanks for sharing that. And also sharing your email because like not everybody has to share their email address. Yeah, or sure. do that. So, so I appreciate that. So first of all, I just want to say thank you for listening, Elevation Nation. It's through your support we continue to grow and bring you more great guests. So please leave us a five-star review on iTunes and Stitcher Radio and we'll continue to elevate you. Now at this point, Kate, I just want to say it's been a pleasure. I feel like there's more to dig into with you. I mean, we didn't really go as far into family because I, I, I kind of feel like there's a, there's a big thing there for... I say a takeaway for people to take home because it's kind of like, you know, all too often we get caught up in business and yet we all have lives, you know, I've got children as well. So I can relate to obviously where, where you're at. And I think a lot of other people are probably thinking, well, how the heck do you manage all of that stuff and have kids during that seven year period? But Hey, ho, you know, life's got to go on. But I just want to say from, from my point of view, I, I think you kind of dialed into, uh, I can't remember the exact quote, but Steve jobs, you know, this is for the dreamers and, I really like the fact that you say you give yourself space to dream, but also you do the work. And I think that is the message of today, guys. You know, if you want to smash through the goals, yeah, dream, think big, but actually do the work. And I just want to say, Cade Wilcox, it has been an absolute pleasure. And you are up there with some of the top guests we've had on this show. Oh, wow. so Thanks, man. Thank you for your time. Yeah, I really appreciate you having me. It's been a lot of fun. You're welcome. Take care. Goodbye.